there will be an emphasis on the relationship being the major you know agent for cure not the particular modality or not drive instinct or not xxx but the relationship so in 2022 where we are now i think that's a really important point that whatever modalities we talk about for stock existential psychotherapy person-centered counseling transaction analysis they all would say i believe that the relationship is far more important than the actual theoretical model we demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations this is the therapy show behind closed doors podcast with bob cook and jackie jones welcome back to episode 79 of the therapy show behind closed doors with the wonderful mr bob cook and myself jackie jones and in this episode we're going to be discussing therapy past present and the future yes good title um especially as i'm 72 so i don't know i mean i'm a good person to talk about psychotherapy past present and my ideas about the future in terms of the psychotherapy world because the past well i've been around when did i 84 was my first introduction to the counseling certificate wow 85 i started psychotherapy training 86 i became a psychotherapist 88 i became a group psychotherapist uh 89 i became a clinical transaction analyst uh 92 i became a supervising transaction analyst european 93 i started my own institute and we could go up and up so i think the institute's anniversary next year then in 88 so what's next year no, I thought you said in 93 you started the Institute. Oh, no, sorry. 93, I started the first ever training. Wow. Uh, 88 was when I started the Institute. And 93, I started the first ever psychotherapy training in transaction analysis. And we've done one ever since, every year, every October. And I was just thinking about uh, where we go now. It's, you know, it was four years running. And I was thinking about, I don't know. You know if i'm where i'm going to go if i'm going to continue running them because if i ever sort of let the institute go which has been around a long time now it's got a four-year spiral on it yeah so if i sort of you know slow down or t- tend to retire then i'm as i say i'm 72 so i'd be 76. uh so i'll be 76 and do it anyway for another day and I mean, it's a good podcast about you know how do therapists retire yeah it is yeah literally because we have a duty of care yeah um and especially how people how you know directors founders of psychotherapy training institutes retire when they've got 60 or 70 students things like that that'd be a good past podcast really good it podcast. Would. it would because you're very experienced in it but yeah, you're also so, very experienced in past therapy, the present therapy, and I'm sure you've got ideas about future therapy and how it's all going to pan out. Yeah, so if we start off with, we'll compare the three. If we start off past psychotherapy, I mean, uh, I, I don't know when you started the world of psychotherapy. I know when you started training in my head, but I don't know when you started actually perhaps going into therapy the first time, then started training. What's What sort of date was that i started at the institute in 2012 Mm. and um i dipped my toe into person centered probably about 18 years ago i did a short one year course on person centered so 18 years ago takes us to 2004 yeah 2004 is where you can start talking from can't you yeah and then of course you can talk about 2008 and of course you can talk about where you are in 2022 yeah yeah and, you know um 
I'll go back. So I started um, with my own psychotherapist in 1984. So how many years ago is that? Nearly when, 40. What is it? 38? 38 years ago. Uh, so if I look at where psychotherapy was 38 years ago, because 85 I went on the first counseling course, 86 I started a training. Uh, so I can talk about around those days and perhaps beyond as well, because um, I can talk about psychotherapy. So if we, if we go right back, right, right, right back, um, psychoanalysis really was the first you know, beginnings, if you like, of looking at um, men uh, mental health issues. I mean, if we go back before psychoanalysis, I suppose we're into religious healing. Yeah. So we can go all the way back. And then Freud came along and his cohort of people who started to look at the difference between the mind and the brain. And also he was very interested in dream analysis but he's really known as the godfather, I think, of, um, if you like, psychotherapy, psychoanalysis yeah. in those early days. And that would be right back to sort of his first book, I think, was Hysteria in 1888. So we're going back quite a while to psychoanalysis. So if we sort of start there and work our way up. So what I can happily talk about those beginnings, but I, I like to include you. What what do you know about psychoanalysis and those early beginnings of uh, looking at understanding the mind and psychological emotions? Do you know anything yourself? Only the stereotypical stuff where, do you know what I mean? You're laid on a couch and you were, you know, analysed um, and, you know, electric shock treatments and lobotomies and all random things like that that you see in the films. But that's pretty much all I know about. So if we go back to the sort of 1887, 1888, when Freud started to discover his ideas of the, on the mind and the bridge between mind and emotions and how emotions can be held in the body and specifically played out symbolically in dreams. Um, that was the first time really where people were encouraged, especially by those early psychoanalysts, to actually go to psychoanalysts to look at their mental health pro problems, if you like. Up till then, it was very much, I said, you had religious healing before that, but there was not much at looking at, you know, mental health issues, emotions and the body at all. Um, and of course, you're right back into the era of uh, mental health sort of uh, institutions where people were just mm. left. Uh, in asylums, if you like, and um, you know, it was they, mainly um, women were associated with hysteria, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, and hysteria was, was sort of a blanket term uh, for things they didn't understand, really. Yeah. Um, and uh, you're right, in a way, you're correct. A lot of women were, um, or when there was emotional escalation, or there was. Uh, her, her early hysterics they were largely thought largely in the world of women and asylums were really the only treatment if you yeah. like they were, they were sent to and they could be locked up in there for a very, definitely very a lot of women yeah and there's many very gruesome documentaries about that but people who had money um uh, and wanted to look at you know some of the mental health treatments um, started to turn or might start to turn themselves to the early psychoanalysts, especially Freud and Jung and Bauber and people like that, where you're correct again, uh, the major treatment was free association, basically lying on a couch. Yeah. Free association means simply means just talking about whatever comes in your mind. Yeah. And the method of those early, we'll say earlier is psychotherapy, but it's, it's very different from that term we know now. The analyst, because they were called analysts, and patients were called patients uh, rather than clients, the analyst would interpret, if you like, those free associative 
verbal discourse and they were trained perhaps to give two or three interpretations an hour because the treatment was an hour yeah um, and it was through the analysis of those interpretations um, that led to you know the patient having more awareness or understanding of themselves which theoretically would lead to cure so cure really for the early psychoanalyst was awareness I like the way that you keep using the word interpretation. Oh. I think that's quite important because you touched on or you said something about, you know, dream therapy or, or things like that. That that's open to interpretation. Yeah, it's all interpretation. Back then. Yeah. Um, I mean, Freud started to write quite a lot of books. Um, Jung did, Bauber did, and quite a a lot of those early existential, no, the, let's call them psychoanalysts, those early psychoanalysis. And of course, Freud um, really compared the mental, you know, how can I explain it, the, the mind to symbolically like a, you know, like a, an engine or the mental apparatus was seen as driven by drives and um, early instincts and um, like the libido and um, you know these early drives that's what I'm saying you can put it over to a sort of engine if you like because the organism is driven by drives and so the analysis of these drives the death instinct uh, libido etc etc um, and it, that was the sort of early thinking about drive theory led to a lot of the psychological um, analysis, yeah. uh, not anything to do with you know, the study of relationships or, or study of emotions or emotional literacy. I think it was sort of built around the idea of drive theory. And if we can understand drive theory, we then can understand what drives the organism to continually repeat these patterns or dysfunction. Um, and it wasn't until much, much later this, when the term psychotherapy came around, when we looked at, you know, a therapy of the psyche and behavior and emotions and spirituality and cognition. Um, it was very much a study of drive theory. So yeah. That was the very early uh, thoughts about looking at my, the mind and what, what drives the personality, if you like. Or what drives the mental dysfunction my like the, the way that i think about it as well there was a lot of things i know you said about the drives and everything but there was a lot of things based around sex or you know like the oedipus syndrome or something or other where little boys are supposed to fall in love with the mum and you know all that sort of there was there was a lot angled towards that side of it was there or well, not Yes, we are into sex, you know, sexual drives again. Um, but yes, you're correct. I mean, you know, that's why some people see the um, this early, early um, thinking, especially around Freud again, uh, which is what would accuse him of being obsessed with um, seeing drive theory, theory perhaps through a sex, sexual um, terrain, the way you've explained it. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I, I, I don't know much about it, but that's the one thing that stuck in my head. There seem to be a lot of things around that. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't really follow drive theory much. As I say, I'm much more into looking at personality models in a different way and driven by relationship and attachment theory rather than yeah. drives. But one thing I would take from Freud, by the way, and I, I'd be interested in discussion with you, is uh, he, he, he's following from Oedipus, really, your ideas of Oedipus and the Electra complex. Um, he did say that symbolically, uh, you know, uh, we marry our father and we marry our mothers. I, I, I yeah. And that's interesting, isn't it? It is, it is, because they say, you know, the, if you want to know what your wife's going to be like, look at the mum and 30 years and there you go. So I suppose, I don't know whether there's a grain of truth in that or that's where it comes from, but yeah. Well, script theory from transaction analysis. Yeah. 
example. Yeah. Uh, and if you look back at, for the TA people listening, Claude Steiner, who was a prodigal son of Eric Byrne, the creative transaction analysis, um, he formed what was called the script matrix and talked about those very important primal influences from the mother and father coming to, you know, you remember the diagram? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So a lot of early TA thinking is about script and the influence of the parents. And the so where, and where, where is that then? If we move on to, you know, the present, are you looking at like 1960s-ish when, because I've seen some clips on YouTube where they're all sat smoking in a room, just, you know, discussing things uh, with Eric uh, Byrne. And... Uh, no, I haven't got to the present at all. Oh, um, if, we're moving up to, if we're moving up to the birth of transaction analysis in the late 50s, early 60s, which I still call the past. Right, because, yeah. Because TA therapy in its origin is completely different in many, many ways from the way that TA is um, practiced today and even thought about. I mean, if we're going to look at um, TA uh, past, which is really um, late 50s, beginning of the 60s, and uh, into the early 70s, um, certainly transaction analysis was a different animal. I mean, the, the basic personality model of parent, adult, child survived, even though there's a lot of um, different expansions of that model, but the basic model of PAC is survived to today. And some of the basic theories around strokes, transactions, games, rackets, what you will get in a 101 still forms the lexicon of the um, theory today. But, but, but you see, over time, the style, the methods, the application of TA has changed dramatically. Yeah. So you would probably, if you, you know, I come from Manchester, but if, if we've got all the TA therapists from Manchester around, I would guarantee you that a high, high, high percentage, maybe into the, into the 90s at least, would think of using um, uh, transaction analysis relationally in some way. Yeah. Or, they, or stroke and their work would include uh, going into the child ego state. In fact, I would almost say 100% out of 100% transaction yeah. analysis would talk about doing some actionistic work with the child ego state. So Whereas, in that early days, in the late 50s, 60s, 70s, -ish, was that kind of like a, a bridge between the psychoanalyzing and what we see today? There was a bit of both yeah. in there somehow. Yeah, well, but I started off with psychoanalysis. Now, psychoanalysis, Freud did have the th a theory of the personality, same as TA's got a theory of the personality with parent, adult, child. And Freud had a theory of the personality in the beginning of the, you know, 19, you know, 1880, 1890, if you like, uh, which was the... the almost like a tripartite mod model of the id yeah ego and super ego and if you split the unconscious into three parts the 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 person is coming from three parts of the unconscious which is the id uh which you know which is this you know parental side if you want to look at it that way from ta you know the ego which is adult from ta um and then you've got the c it's, sorry, it is child in TA terms. Superego is parent, that's right. And, um, you know, the ego is adult. So you could borrow it across in terms of theories of the personality. Wow. Um, but no, psychoanalysis, I think, it, it was was around for a long time. And it still, still is practiced, by the way. Yeah. But what came along, really, um, was the term psychotherapy and different models of uh, looking at how the personality was formed and the idea of moving away to thinking about attachment theory um, and thinking about um, cure in a different way than the psychoanalyst thought of cure. So as a psychoanalyst, the early psychoanalyst, and you know maybe even today, thought of cure in terms of awareness that 
as the person became more aware that led to cure yeah but, but psychotherapists of course went a step further which yes part of psychotherapy or analysis of the therapy so that's what's called psychotherapy yeah um no it might lead to um awareness but you need to go a step further to look at what needs to be integrated to be at or to be actioned so it, you know like for example if you, you you know you can smoke as much as you like and then in fact there's you know if you pick up most uh cigarette packets you'll see at the front of it and i don't smoke but i think they say on the front of it uh this is a danger to your health or yeah. cigarettes kill yeah right many people can become aware of that but then don't stop. Smoking, don't stop smoking <clears throat> yeah yeah and that's what that's sort of it isn't it you can be aware of many things and don't change yeah the psychotherapy said well uh, well let's take a step this step further and look at how a person can integrate a lot of their awareness and change their behaviors uh, and in turn change their personality and therefore cure is at that end yeah rather than just well, bring it to our attention yeah 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 so psychotherapy was born more as a bridge if you like you know whether it's gestalt psychotherapy whether it was existential psychotherapy whether humanistic any of the humanistic psychotherapies or the client-centered psychotherapy of carl rogers which eventually came called as client-centered counseling but started if its world it started its beginnings of course as client-centered psychotherapy yeah it changed its name to counseling but that's another whole podcast um and they wanted to look at a change uh, in a different way past the world of awareness and also had different uh, theories of the personality than, 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 the, than the drive theory of the early analysts they would, would take in consideration things like attachment theory um where does relationship pay play in all this lot yeah so there's so that i would see psychotherapy was the next sort of yeah bridge, if you like and yeah. transaction analysis it was one of these humanistic psychotherapy models so there might be somebody around today that is is working on psychotherapy of the future because yeah we haven't got the different future, schools yeah. of ta everybody's got their own slant on it yeah, you know, ta well. is an overarching umbrella but within that there's different schools of, of ta Correct. if we stayed into ta if we stay in looking at you know the evolution of practitioners who you know we have drive theory there are psychoanalysts still who follow drive theory by the way yeah we have myriad of psychotherapists with and a myriad of way of looking at how personalities develop and personality models as i said i just mentioned a few of them from gestalt psychotherapy to existential psychotherapy and they're all still going but within gestalt psychotherapy or within existential psychotherapy or within transactionalysis there's many styles evolutions and ways of looking at things yeah so I'm in my institute there's a gestalt psychotherapy for example um there's a body psychotherapist uh, many of my colleagues are ex existential psychotherapists so within the particular school if you want to use that or the approach is many styles yeah now we picked on transaction analysis because both of us were trained in that but out of transaction analysis there's another model that appeared called integrative psychotherapy it does have ego state as its heart and script is at heart but it has integration as the cure yeah so out of different styles if you're models come other models yeah. so i think wendy dryden's book um one of his books one i'm thinking of i can't remember the title in 2006 or something came up with um something like there was 673 um models of psychotherapy wow that's a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
TA is a major one, of course. Yeah. So, you know, we have psychoanalysis, we have psychotherapy, we have the evolution of psychotherapy into lots of different models and different approaches. And many of those approaches and models have changed over time to 2022. But but I think one I would say that if we look at psychotherapy per se, and transaction analysis is in that, for example, especially in the humanistic tradition, they do have one overarching, well, many overarching concepts, but one of them, of course, is the past affects the present. Yeah. Which is yeah. the basis of the transactional analysis that I was trained yeah. in, yeah. Yeah. So the, you've had an evolution away from drive theory, even though drive, even though the psychoanalysts believe very much a study of the first three years was important in terms of helping the patient develop more awareness through the interpretation of the analyst. Yeah, I mean, so they really did believe it passed the fact of the present, but their methods was very different. So a lot of the methods of the many of the psychotherapists today, but we've evolved into lots of different psychotherapeutic models, which include other theories, as I said, like attachment theory, like relational theory. And we yeah. can put in body theories to that. We look at spirituality to that. And they're all methods of helping the person, uh, helping the client, patient, or whatever terminology we're going to use, um, be moved to cure. So where do you see the future in it then, Bob? What do you see? Where we are today. We had a term that came through generally in 1992, I think. Uh, and, and I don't know which book we could credit to this term. I think maybe, you know, Stephen Mitchell, one of the most famous psychoanalysts, perhaps might take ownership of this term. But I don't think one particular book can take ownership of this term. And the term is called the relational turn. So until the early 90s, the, the, that term didn't exist, but in the early 90s it did, I don't know which book we could credit it to, but it's the idea um, that it's the relationship between the client and the therapist. We've moved away from the term patient now to client, yeah. It's the relationship between the therapist and client, which is the most important and central pivotal process towards cure than any theoretical model. Yeah. So it's not transactionalized, it's not bestowed therapy, it's not client-centered counseling, it's not, we can list them all, couldn't we? Yeah, yeah. It's, it isn't the theoretical models that has the one answer to cure. In fact, it is the importance of the relationship between the therapist and client that becomes the major curative factor. And while I'm talking to you, I think in the major book that came out, I think that probably did lead to this term was the book by North Cross, I think in 1992, uh, where they looked at a lot of the different modalities and a lot, and I think research of I don't know how many people that came up or showed the relationship was the major factor between the, you know, the, the therapist and the patient, um, client, sorry, uh, which uh, which was effective in terms of cure. So it's from that time that, in fact, if you went in most of the beauty bookshops now, whatever style of book that you picked up, Bristol TA or whatever it is, there will be an emphasis on the relationship being the major, you know, agent for cure, not the particular modality, or not drive instinct, or not XXX, but the relationship. So in 2022, where we are now, I think that's a really important point, that whatever modalities we talk about, Gestalt, existential psychotherapy, person-centered counseling, transaction analysis, they all would say, I believe, that the relationship is far more important than the actual theoretical model. Yeah. Which I tend to agree with. 
you know, yeah, the, the relationship can make or break the therapy process. Yeah. yeah. If you trained in 2004 and 2012, then that's the that's the influence that would have been coming through the training institutes anyway. The, yeah. Though you might have been trained in TA or person centered or whatever it is, a very important message and training that therapist or or counsellor needs to pay a very strong emphasis on what's happening between the therapist and the client as a way to understand cure. So we have an import we have a central importance on such concepts as transference, yeah. counter transference, intersubjectivity, what's happening between the two of you as an agent for understanding and analyzing cure. Yeah. So where, so where where are we moving to then, Bob? What's after well, the just, relation? I will, but if we just stay here a moment, uh, and let's go to your practice a moment. Um, uh, and you've worked for many years as a therapist now. So in, in what I'm saying is 2022, there's a huge emphasis of relationship, and I would suspect that you that in your years as a therapist, you do think about the relationship, yeah, yourself as client, as a way of analysing the way forward. Yeah, yeah, how we interact and and how that relationship can change, you know, session to session, moment to moment, even. Yeah. So, in your way of thinking. And, then, and also, I'd be interested in this, Jack, and I, I think we've talked about what I'm going to say in previous podcasts, but I, would, we, I think it's important to reiterate again. One of the, and you'll have been trained this way because of, of the central pivotalness on relationships um, as a curative factor, is how much you share of yourself in the relationship. Mm. Becomes, I'm sure you've thought about that. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons why I just dipped a toe in person-centered counselling and didn't kind of pursue it because, you know, we were kind of told to leave ourselves outside the therapy room. At all costs. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and I, I get that it's not about us in the therapy room, but to me, yeah. it didn't sit well that I couldn't bring myself fully into the room with, with the client. And of course, the first psychoanalyst analyst that I was talking about also preached that, what you've just said. Yeah. Keep yourself outside the field. Because yeah. I know the client, you know, a lot of the habitual behaviour and the past and everything is out of their awareness, but I don't see myself as an expert in that room. They're the, they're, they're, they are the expert on themselves in that room even if it's out of their awareness a lot of the stuff mm, mm. so that the right. idea of being the one in charge of the session and directing the client never really sat well with me so it's probably true to say then is it is that you might call yourself a relational psychotherapist in the sense that you think about the relationship as an agent for cure yeah yeah and how you would use it yeah and we unearth things mutually Do you know to me that i've said to clients before now that we dump everything in the middle of the floor and you know metaphorically we sift through it and you know work through together. it together in a co-created way yeah yeah so that is the opposite diametric opposite from before 1950s yeah in other words, if you went to a bookshop in the 1950s, before the 1950s, the majority of the books would be all about how you keep yourself out of a relationship. If you go to bookshops now, in 2022, it would all be about how, <laughs> how you bring yourself that. into it. Yeah. yeah. So there's a dramatic change in understanding or thinking about you know how cure is affected yeah now if we if we go to the future now this is where we can both just hypothesize yeah if i i'll start it off then i think that there will be a great well we're starting to see it anyway so 
we are moving a lot towards um, online therapy. Yeah. The same, uh, you know, in the COVID years, um, Zoom was used a lot, online therapy, and I wouldn't like, I've not done the research on it, but I, I would imagine a dramatic increase because we couldn't meet up. Yeah. So people yeah. took all their clients online. And, uh, you know, as we're coming out of the pandemic, I haven't seen that stop. No. I've seen, I have seen, of course, a reduction back to face to face. And quite a big, I mean, a lot of the clients that I come into my, you know, when I do the assessments, all one face to face, by the way. Yeah. But you've also seen reported a lot of therapists do do a mixture of Zoom therapy and face to face and some therapists who stay on have stayed exclusively on zoom and i think the rise or the increasing or the evolution of online therapy in some form will start to start will start to you know it was prominent anyway now i said with the pandemic will we'll, we'll, we'll increase in that way yeah i believe it will become more mainstream than yeah if it's not now yeah and that's interesting because and I, again i don't know this and you might know this in terms of research it is there and i'm sure that it is by the way but i haven't looked on it before this podcast is there a training exclusively exclusively on zoom therapy for example so you trained in transaction analysis yeah. in 2012 perhaps there is now on I think um, there is added training to it do you know what I mean? You can you can do a bit of extra training on how to be, you know, in a Zoom conversation with a client, paying more attention to your background and your body language because obviously it's through a screen. Yeah, your methods. Are style. Yeah, yeah. But whether whether it's entirely online without any background information, I I I don't know. Well, I, you can I, even I, have therapy via text now and voice messages yeah. and things without them actually yeah. seeing you. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. And of course, there's some styles of therapy yeah. that lends itself much more into Zoom, the use of Zoom. So CBT, for example, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, which is the favoured therapy by the NHS in the United Kingdom, I think lends itself much more accessibly to Zoom Mm. and say relational therapy see i see cbt as angling towards coaching as opposed to psychotherapy because it's very solution focused it's very goal orientated which i see coaching as that you come in with a goal and you know we we'll have a plan on how we're going to reach that goal so it fits into zoom much more yeah yeah than some of the you know, psychodynamic transaction analysis, many of these different models, because they would favor perhaps, a, you know, a study on the relationship as being more effective to cure yeah, yeah. rather than what you were just talking about. So I think that certainly be more moved towards online therapy, text therapy, Instagrams and things like that. Another area perhaps, it would, and I haven't read a book with this term, somebody said to me there is a book term this and it's called robotic therapy in other words the use and emergence of robots i think i saw something on a facebook post about that uh, therapy of the future yeah i was listening to the the uh or reading about elon musk yeah we heard him, the richest person yeah. in the world yeah his basic two People know him for the creation of Telsa, the electric motors, and of course the creation of space rockets, private yeah. space rockets for multi-planetary expansion. And well, you might not know or do know that he's also very interested in um, the mind and putting neuro chips into mines, and ex that's going to help in mental health and putting money into, I don't know if the, if the term is the therapeutic robots, but I'm going to use it, it might be another term. Yeah. And so you go along 
or you wouldn't go along, there'd be a portal probably. Up would pop with Charlie the robot. Yeah. Which would say, and how are you today, Mr. Cook? What is your um, mental health today? And you say, well, I feel, I feel a bit down. Oh, in terms of um, feeling down, in a ratio of one to 10, are you six or are you five? You know, you'll get that type of yeah. robot. And I was listening, I don't know when it was, it was about a week ago on Channel 4, talking about the, the expansion of robotic therapy. And I don't know if that's the phrase, but it sticks in my mind. Where they had developed Charlie to such an extent um, that had been researched, this, that, the other, and people going along, et cetera. So this is in America. And what they were stuck on, what they're stuck on, is empathy. Yeah. How do you program empathy into a robot? And they were discussing about learned empathy and being able to not lot, and it won't be long, have, a, have an empathic chip so the robot can talk about feelings. I see. I don't like all of that, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be out of a job, won't we? <laughs> well, I think, I, for me personally, I see the future being completely split. Yes, the online, robotic, not face-to-face -face stuff, but then I see another pathway of, you know, connection to to nature and the planet and you know walking out through a forest and having walking therapy and you know the the whole holistic physical mental spiritual bit together so in my head there's going to be two completely different camps two universes yeah because we, we are you know moving into a society where everything's rushed you know having to travel an hour to see your therapist to have an hour of therapy and then travel an hour back I think those days are maybe numbered so doing it online or a text message is like right quick do it you therapize me and then I can go and live my life type of thing and then there's the other one where it becomes a way of a way of life and part of our life and an experience rather than an end goal, if that kind of makes sense. Yes, it makes great sense. And do you think a third dimension would be uh, psychotherapy stroke spirituality, or would you put that all in the holistic dimension you're talking about? I think maybe in the holistic, but on the peripheries. It's like, you know, animal assisted therapy and things. There's, there's that many variations on the holistic well-being of us as human beings and the connection that's the bit i think the robotic side is going to miss is is that relational and that connection with somebody which to me is vital well i was just i, I was just thinking about learned empathy because there's a whole a whole debate about empathy and um you know it being learned so i was thinking people with asperger's or autistic etc etc and, uh, and can you teach empathy um, and the idea of an empathy chip given to robots? Um, what do you think of that sort of idea? So they can ask about feelings and explore how a person's feeling today. Well, I'm thinking from a brain that came into its own in 1966. So that's like, do you know what I mean? I, I don't know. I just wondered what you thought. Yeah. I mean, I think you're. I think you're right. Um, I think you're right. It was only you idea about ten years ago, or less, six years ago, seven years ago, in the assessment. Some somebody was talking about, you know, they, they were depressed, so they went along to the doctors, and the doctors said, "Oh, oh, I know. Uh, perhaps you need some therapy. Um, you know, you can go to what the website called Beat the Blues, and do a CBT questionnaire." Uh, if we'd have had the conversation when I started in, or maybe even when you started, but I started in 1985, I would think that's never going to happen. Yeah. Where we are now, 
I would have never thought listening to the radio on Channel 4 last week or the week before talk about robotic therapy and yeah. talking about the problems about getting a chip um, so they can put learned empathy chip, if you like, into the computer and, and then the computer can talk about it. I would not, I, I would, it would blow a mind. But if you ask me where I think we might go. Oh, definitely. I, I, you know, and there might be a, a, a need for that for some people. Yeah. And I, but I also agree completely with you, by the way, is I think there's the equine therapy, the walking therapy, the therapy of nature, yeah. the development, all that areas you're talking about, I think will only expand. I, I think there's, there's a camp of people that are progressive and forward thinking and technology based. And then I think there's another group of people that want to strip it all back, oh. go back to the good old days or back to nature or, you know, that the planet provides us with everything that we need if we don't trash it type people. <laughs> and I think there is going to be two different camps. Mm. It, it, and I think I think we have got it now in a way, um, and certainly I think I think that listen to the whole idea about robotic therapy. You know, I'm sure that will increase. Uh, it should be an expansion in the other world as well. And I'm not far off retirement, so <laughs> that'll be, be really interesting to. <laughs> we can sit back and see what happens. <laughs> That'll be really interesting to see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've really enjoyed that, Bob. I think that's yeah. It, it's it's fantasy now, but yeah, you know, things things are always evolving and changing, and you know, evolution isn't a bad thing. No, it, 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 I love the discussion though because yeah, it allows me to play with the idea. Yeah. Food for thought, definitely. So until next time, Bob. When we will be discussing dealing with suicidal issues on this run up to Christmas. <laughs> I think just on that before we disappear, when I went into John Lewis's near where I lived the other day and I saw all the Christmas, um, Father Christmases and Christmas stuff starting up, I felt suicidal. <laughs> Title. So this will be a wonderful podcast. Please don't switch off next week because, on a serious note, you know there's been a, such a rise uh, in suicide, especially in young men in the last uh, decade. Uh, that, that, that is a really important subject. I, I'm sure all therapists uh, will, in their professional career, uh, be facing these issues. Yeah. Until next time, Bob. Thank you. No. Bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.